Mao was also beginning to question China's relationship with the Soviet Union. When Nikita Khrushchev and Mao met in 1958, they kept up appearances of solidarity. But in private, they disagreed on major issues. During the visit, Mao did not tell Khrushchev that he was about to launch military action against his old enemy, the nationalists. When the communists took power in 1949, the defeated nationalist government fled to Taiwan, also called Formosa. Led by Chiang Kai-shek, they still claimed to be the true government of China, and they had American support. The United States must remove any doubt regarding our readiness to fight, if necessary, to preserve the vital stake of the free world in a free Formosa. The nationalists hoped one day to retake the mainland. Their troops trained on islands which lay just off China's coast. In August 1958, the communists began to shell them. President Eisenhower stood firm in his commitment to the nationalists. Mao did not want a war with the United States. After a few tense weeks, he stopped the bombardment. The crisis petered out, but it had lasting repercussions. While Khrushchev backed the Chinese communists in public, he was furious with Mao. The attack could have triggered a superpower war. In 1959, the two men met for the last time. A year later, they broke off relations. But foreign criticism did not sway Mao's government. They viewed conflict with the nationalists as a purely domestic matter. The same was true, they asserted, of their actions in Tibet. For centuries, this remote and religious land had been regarded by the Chinese as part of China. In 1950, the communists enforced their claim by taking over Tibet. In 1959, Tibetans rebelled. The People's Liberation Army crushed the revolt. As reports of atrocities and destruction reached the outside world, China's international isolation deepened. Mao's first concern was still China's economy. Industrial output had doubled in five years, but he was not satisfied. Mao Zedong always hoped to build a socialist economy in China faster than the Soviet Union. He always thought fighting the Revolutionary War was very difficult. There must be a way to speed up agricultural or industrial production. Could it be more difficult than fighting a war? In 1958, Mao launched his most ambitious campaign to date, the Great Leap Forward. His goal was to make China the industrial equal of Western nations in just 15 years. His method was to mobilize the entire country to work day and night by promising a better future. We built reservoirs, planted cotton, cultivated trees, and things like that. When we worked, we had a slogan, catch the stars and moon. We had to work when the stars and moon were out. We had breakfast very early and came home very late. So we worked all day long. We were so enthusiastic. 
To make work exciting, flags flew high in the fields and loudspeakers squealed. People shouted slogans one after another. Mao decided to visit some villages to see what was going on. I went with him. Once we came to a village and saw a banner with these words on it. People's communes are good. He read the words, people's communes are good. A reporter happened to be next to Mao and took down his words. The next day, the words appeared in the newspapers. That's how people's communes started. Mao's word was so powerful that almost overnight, people's communes sprang up across China. A commune encompassed many villages with thousands of families. Each day was strictly regimented, and family life was virtually abolished. Children were placed in communal nurseries while their parents worked around the clock. People ate in the fields or in communal dining halls. To increase industrial output, communes were ordered to make steel. The slogan was to overtake England and catch up with America. The idea was that if everybody worked hard and everywhere in the country people refined steel, then we would catch up very soon. People collected walks, pots, bed frames, and tools, anything made of iron or steel. They built small furnaces to melt them. The biggest challenge was to keep the furnaces fueled. We burned tables, chairs, window frames. And finally, we even opened old coffins and used the wood. They really stank. We kept the fires burning day and night. And for convenience, we built work sheds close to the furnaces. One day I worked very late and I was totally exhausted. We had separate sheds for men and women. But I was so tired I couldn't tell the difference. I just walked into a shed, lay down and fell asleep. When I woke the next morning, I found I was in the men's shed. Of course it was all right, nobody cared. All we cared about was making as much steel as we could. At night, you could see many furnaces along the railroad. Fire shot out of the furnaces. This made people excited. China was going through a great change. China was becoming a very rich and strong country. All this seemed to have happened overnight. Mao was very pleased. But the steel people made was useless. We used it to make pots of all sizes. But when people heated them, they cracked and leaked. If only we had the equipment to make good steel, but we didn't. We only had people. Our methods were very primitive. Of course we didn't make good steel. People were unhappy, but nobody dared say anything. The result was that everything made of iron and steel was taken from every family and was made useless. We had no tools left to use. While the government called on everyone to make steel, they also wanted to increase farm output. How could we increase the grain harvest? People said that if you did close planting and used more fertilizer, you would definitely increase output. People got carried away. They were hot-headed. From Mao Zedong and the Central Party Committee down to leaders at all levels, everyone was full of enthusiasm. 
During the Great Leap Forward, we believed miracles could happen. There was a saying, the corn will grow higher the more you desire. Communes and schools reported their wonderful news to the party. If one commune said they could turn out 150 tons an acre, another one would say their target was 180 tons. Each commune or school would promise a higher amount until the last school gave their highest figure. Our school set the target of 470 tons an acre. We dug a hole, something like a swimming pool. We thought if we put all the fertilizer in it, we would achieve our target. Then we poured the seeds in, which built up into a layer about this thick. There was a photograph in the People's Daily that showed the wheat in a field supporting the weight of children. Some leaders of the Central Party Committee were so happy that they put this photo on their desks at work. Most people believed it. We were surprised to see that photo and wondered how it could be possible. But because we were city people, we couldn't be sure it was a fake. When I went with Mao to the villages, I really did see so much grain in the fields, so much rice. The yields were so high. At the time, I thought everything was true. After the anti-rightist campaign, few dared to ask questions. Only one teacher spoke out. How thick would the wheat be if we did produce 470 tons? Immediately, he was accused of being a rightist and not believing in the party. Later, I learned it was all fake. The peasants were putting on a show for us. They moved grain from other places and put it all in one field. It was all a show for Mao. Under pressure to produce more, to launch satellites to heaven, as it was called, party officials inflated production figures. An ominous cycle began as the state took more and more grain based on false figures, leaving the peasants with nothing to eat. For example, the output was five tons of grain, but ten tons were reported. Then the state would collect grain based on 10 tons. Our commune committee calculated that our yield was 1,800 pounds an acre. It didn't qualify us to go up to heaven. But the deputy had an idea. He added the melons, fruits, pears, peaches, turnips, and vegetables to the grain, counting them as grain output. So the yield became 2,600 pounds per acre. Now we were qualified to go up to heaven. The commune committee did not want to calculate this way. It was cheating. But those people were higher up. What could we do? I have this problem. I get emotional very easily. I wondered why the higher the official, the more he dared to lie, to deceive the party and the people. Zhang Hongbin, the financial secretary, was horrified when he heard such an enormous figure. He said, are you letting people eat? This is sheer absurdity. Party officials ignored the protests and continued to submit the inflated figures. The state took the grain accordingly. It was sent to feed the cities, repay Soviet debts, or left to rot in warehouses. Peasants across China were beginning to starve. Anhui was one of the four provinces worst hit. All my mother could do was gather weeds with my aunt. There wasn't enough grain, so we ate weeds. 
By the summer of 1959, the leaders knew the great leap forward was going badly wrong. Mao decided to go back to Shaoshan, his hometown, to have a look. He wanted to find out the truth. He wanted people to speak freely. I think that when he was in Shaoshan, he found that there really were problems in the Great Leap Forward. After his trip, Mao decided to moderate production targets. In July 1959, the party met at the mountain resort of Lushan to set new, realistic goals. Minister of Defense Peng Dehuai, the hero of the Korean War, was one of Mao's oldest revolutionary comrades. For my generation of officials, Peng Dehuai was a very down-to-earth peasant and an excellent combat general. He hated fraud and hypocrisy. He said what was on his mind. Back in the early days, if he needed to talk to Mao and saw that Mao was still in bed, he would go and pull off his quilt, saying, get up, let's talk. He said, but now it's very difficult to have that kind of relationship. He is the chairman. It's so hard to see him, let alone discuss things with him. Peng wrote to Mao describing what he saw as the problems of the Great Leap Forward. What Peng intended as loyal criticism, Mao saw as political treachery. When Mao Zedong started the meeting, he said he had not slept all night. He couldn't sleep, even after he took his sleeping pills. He just got up and called this meeting. He was very serious. You could see that at times he was very angry. He said, it's all right for you to oppose me. When I have no alternative, I'll just take the Liberation Army, go up to the mountains, and carry out guerrilla warfare. Finally, the resolution was that Peng Duhuai was against the Communist Party. When Mao left the room, I was following him. Peng was in front of us. Mao called him. Marshal Peng, if there are any questions, we can talk. Peng swung his arm and said, what's there to talk about? There's nothing more to say. Zhou Enlai and Liu Shaoqi agreed with Peng, but even they did not dare speak out. Nobody had the courage to oppose Mao Zedong. He was considered absolutely correct. He stood high and looked far. People thought they were not up to Mao's level. Even if someone wanted to make a comment, he would not dare say anything or reveal his own feelings. As a result, production goals were not cut. Officials continued to demand more grain than the peasants could give. The Great Leap Forward continued through 1960. Millions of peasants were starving. Old peasants said in a fury, no, grain comes from the blood and sweat of peasants. It doesn't grow on the backs of intellectuals. Who do they think they're fooling? In wartime, we protected them and saved their lives. Now we provide them with food and clothing. They have full stomachs, and still they come to cheat us. Don't they have a conscience? My aunt's family was a typical big family in the countryside, with several generations living together. There were 36 people altogether. During the three years of famine, one died after another. Eventually, only three people were left alive. At first, when someone died, they would take the body and bury it. 
Later, they didn't have the strength to take the bodies out. They could only look at them. They watched the bodies being eaten by rats and their eyeballs dug out. People didn't even have the strength to chase the rats away. The famine was very severe and widespread, but newspapers did not report it at all. People only knew that their local area was suffering. To keep the news from spreading, peasants were not allowed to leave their areas, even to beg. At first, peasants ate everything they had at home. Then they ate genyan earth. It's a kind of white clay. There's a legend in the village passed down from generation to generation. It says that this clay was provided by old mother Genyan, who sympathized with the poor people. People would eat it during the famine because it was very fine. But still, it was hard to swallow. At first, the peasants could swallow a little. But after four or five days, it destroyed their intestines, and they died. After eating all the grass roots and tree bark, they ate the earth. The famine lasted three years. An estimated 30 million people died. Mao's revolution fought to give the Chinese people a better life, had helped create the largest famine in history. In 1961, Hong Duhai, a lone voice, wrote, grain scattered across the ground, potato leaves withered, strong young people have gone to make steel, only children and old women reap the crops. How will they eat next year? Please, think of the people. A campaign called Remember the Bitter Past and Think of the Sweet Present was launched. The peasants were told, Chairman Mao and the party want you to talk about your suffering before 1949, so that young people will realize what a happy life they have now, and how they owe all this to the party and Chairman Mao. The peasants started to talk about the bitter past. Then they forgot that they were supposed to be talking about the old society before 1949. They got carried away and talked about the famine of the last three years. They cried and cried. The officials were scared to death. It was as if the peasants were blaming the Communist Party and Chairman Mao. They said, Grandma Zhang, Grandpa, you can't talk like this. The peasants said, why not? So many in our families died. Never, ever have we had such a terrible time. In China, between 1959 and 1961, an estimated 30 million people died of hunger. Officially, the communist government blamed the catastrophe on floods and drought. But in party meetings, they admitted that the famine was largely created by their own policies. Their efforts to rebuild the country would spark a struggle inside the party. A struggle that would engulf the Chinese people in chaos and terror. <laughs> 